herself and her books. Kate? Hello everyone, um, I'm Kate Ellis and I'm the author of the Wesley Peterson series, um, which uh, blend mystery and history in the South Devon. Um, I've, I just worked out that I've written 24 books in the Wesley series. I didn't realise, <laughs> I thought I can't stop. <laughs> I've also uh, written five books in the uh, Joe Plantagenet series. They're slightly spooky uh, stories set in a thinly disguised York. And I've also uh, written a trilogy uh, set just after the First World War, um, featuring uh, D.I. Albert Lincoln, who's uh, with Scotland Yard, and he gets called up north to investigate some very strange cases. So I've uh, there's two out in the trilogy, but um, I've uh, finished the third, and that's out in November. Oh, that's good to hear because I've the one I've most recently read of yours was a high mortality of doves. Oh yes, that's the first. Yeah, I read the series wrong. I read the second one and then the first. <laughs> Oh, I think with the Wesleys, it doesn't really matter uh, which order you read them in. No, every, everyone stands alone. I think the only thing uh, that changes is the age of his kids and uh, what he's up to domestically. <laughs> but, uh, each case stands alone, so it doesn't uh, matter that much. So my first question I'm going to ask you tonight is from my dad, who actually oh. he founded this group and he's a big fan. Um, he says. He really likes the Joe Plantagenet series, and he's hoping that you're going to write more. Oh, a, a lot, a lot of people are hoping that. <laughs> it's it's not that I don't want to write more. It's that um, with the publishers' contracts and that, I've been kept so busy with the Wesley series and the trilogy that uh, I haven't had a chance. But never say never. I, I would like to write more. Another publisher wants me to. <laughs> uh, Wendy Jones, who's one of our members and an author, says that she really likes the cover that's on the screen. What well, uh, the um, Wesley Wesley covers? Yeah, I think they're brilliant. I, I really do. I think the publisher's done a wonderful job, and I'm not just crawling to my publisher. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think they they do a fantastic job with the covers. I I never have to sort of say oh I can't stand that you know they've, they've really um they've, they've really got it right I think so we've already got questions coming in on the stream I'm going to ask you my question first because right. I'm hosting of course. <laughs> um, why in so in Joe Plantagenet they're sort of set in York but it's called evil Probably. like yeah. the latin name for your yeah Peter Arkham. <laughs> and then um, the wesley series is tradmouth and queensway which is dartmouth and kingsway yes Can you change the names well I, I thought long and hard about this and uh, the thing is that i change things in the books like uh, dartmouth's got a tiny little police station in fact, I think it's just opened up again. It was demolished and you know, made, made into flats with a little police station underneath. And, of course, Tradmouth has to have a police headquarters with CID. And uh, D Dartmouth has a, a little cottage hospital, which sadly has just uh, closed, um, much to the annoyance of uh, the residents. Now, Tradmouth has um, a, a, pro a general hospital, where um, Colin Bowman can do his post-mortems and uh, any unfortunate vi any victims who are fortunate enough to survive can be in intensive care. So, <laughs> so I've had to change things around. Uh, yeah, I've changed quite a lot around, really, use poetic licence. Now, if I called it Dartmouth, I would have got a lot of letters in green ink to uh, complain about, you know, that's not there. No, we haven't got a police headquarters. <laughs> So I thought I thought it was wise to do what Thomas Hardy did and uh, use the place, base the places on the places, but not uh, the right names. <laughs> I suppose then people can still be like, "Oh, that's really York," and sort of. Oh yes, and yeah. Like enjoying the place, even though you. Yeah, I got I got a lot of uh, emails from uh, 
people who used to live in Durham. Oh, I recognise that. I went on holiday to, I don't know, I tried to recognise all Wesley's haunts, you know, so, so yeah, it, yeah, it does work. You get the occasional person saying, oh, well, I didn't use the proper name. But <laughs> Have you ever been tempted to um, release, like, pictures of Wesley's haunts or things like that? You know, when you see people go down there, because I know I've done it when I've been to Dartmouth, wondered where. Oh, yeah. You know, Jerry would like have his bow and things like that. Yeah. That thing I, I, there is a house I call Jerry's house. It's on Bayard's Cove. It's a little house at the end nearest to the pub. And I always, uh, you know, oh, that's Jerry's house. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a nice idea, actually. It's not one I've thought of doing. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I go? I'm gonna go look. I'm going down in a couple of weeks actually, so perhaps I'll take a few pictures. <laughs> uh Wendy Jones asks, where's the strangest place your research has taken you? Because you must have to do quite a lot of research. Oh gosh. Um yeah. <laughs> um I'm trying to think now. I know the strangest place that would have been, the research would have taken me if it hadn't been for COVID. Uh, uh, the book I've just finished at the moment, the, the next Wesley book is called The Butterfly Cage. And in Chesterless Street, uh, attached to the church, there's a little cell um, that used to be um, home to an anchor, anchorite who was sort of confined to this cell for life. Um, almost like a, a monk, but not in a community. And uh, there's a, an anchoress in um, the book. And I wanted to go to Chester Street to see this cell, but uh, of course, unfortunately I never I never did. I was going up to Newcastle Noir, but, but that was uh, canceled. So that's the, the place I would have gone. But I, I did see in, um, Julian of Norwich's cell when I went to Norwich. Um, so that 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 um, <laughs> that does suffice. So but, do you do a lot. You, you do get get to an awful lot of places. I think. Um, oh, the death season. I went to. Uh, I walked along um, the um, south coast coastal. You know the the coastal path, and um, to um, a place called Hall Sands, which was an, a, a ruined village. Um, in South Devon, and uh, that and that uh, featured in uh, the death season. So I, I do sort of go to these places. So I don't know, you know, strangest. I'm not sure. <laughs> so there's like a fun element of like traveling and seeing all the places that you base your novels on, obviously, because you love going to Dartmouth. You've got all the things set in York, which is a beautiful oh, yes. place yeah. as well. Um, how much research do you have to do for like the historical aspect of your books? Oh, a lot, a lot. Um, I use a different period of history in each uh, book, so I have to research it quite quite thoroughly. I did a lot of research for the burial circle about um, uh, 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 mills, um, industrial archaeology. Now, fortunately, I live quite near um, Quarry Bank Mill in Cheshire, which is a National Trust property. And I did a lot of research there into what a mill looks like, what, what a, a mill wheel, you know, turning mill wheel looks like. Could a body get um, caught up in it? <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, I do, I do do an awful lot. And the woolen uh, industry in Devon as well in the in the, the olden days and, you know, I'm a member of a local archaeology group and we had a talk on industrial archaeology and that was very helpful. I Do we ask you to um, check that you get the archaeology sort of scenes correct? Well, I, I have been on quite a few digs, so I, I hope I get it correct. <laughs> Do you have? Well, I've, I've been quite quite uh, fortunate to have archaeologists saying, "Oh yeah, yes, you do that, get that right." <laughs> so I have to, I've been on quite a few. <laughs> well, yeah, I would imagine that does help. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yes, 
And my, my actually, I've, I've got a, a sneaky secret weapon because my son did studied archaeology at York University. So uh, if I want to know anything, I just asked him. Ask him. <laughs> wow, that's an excellent like what an expert to have on hand. Oh yes, yeah. Do you have someone that you use to help sort of research any police procedures and things as well? Because I know like. Wesley is obviously a police. Well, um, I go every year, apart from this year, unfortunately, um, to the Crime Writers Association annual conference. And we always have talks by police officers and taking us through cases and uh, things like that. And they are invaluable. They're really useful. And uh, no, I know a couple of uh, police people, um, police officers from CWA as well, I can always ask if, uh, if needs be. And I've got a wonderful book um, uh, in my on my bookshelves. It's called um, The Crime Writer's Handbook, 60 Ways to Kill Your Victim in Print. And it's got all about the uh, forensic and methods of murder and if their effectiveness and got loads of books on poisons and uh, terrible um, uh, methods of uh, disposing of people. Uh, I'm lucky that my husband doesn't uh, get too jumpy when he comes in my office. Do you ever worry about what people will think of your search history online? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, Samantha, who's one of our admins, says are there any other settings you would like to use ah well um i have been thinking about this actually i write a lot of short stories and i love writing short stories because you can sort of change your setting change the time period no and i i did one set in wales um about a couple of years ago and that's sort of stuck in my mind because my far my family's from north wales and I, I know know it quite well i used to go there a lot with my you know father um when i was young and you know that that appeals to me and you never know <laughs> well we're on settings what made you choose the settings that you use already why 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 dartmouth or tradmouth why york Oh, right. Well, Dartmouth, um, I fell in love with the place uh, in 1984. Uh, we, we were, I had a six month old baby and a friend took pity on us. He had a, a, a timeshare, his parents had a timeshare flat down, down in Torquay. And he took pity on us, say, oh, why don't you come with me to the timeshare? So we, we were grateful. Uh, and he, one day he took us, um, he said, I'm going to take you on a mystery tour. So he took us on the um, the railway to Kings, from Painton to Kings Weir, and then across on the ferry to Dartmouth. And I just fell in love with the place. And we went back every year since with the, with the children, when the children were young and now the children are grown up, just the two of us. Yeah, we, we love it down there. I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> Every time I sort of come down the hill into Dartmouth, I feel, you know, oh, <laughs> really relaxed. <laughs> a good inspiration for crime writers as well, because I guess that Christie's house is very nearby. Oh, yes, yes. I pay my annual uh, pilgrimage to Greenway every year. We usually uh, walk from Kingsweir to, uh, uh, it's quite a tough walk from Kingsweir to Greenway every year. And then get the train back or the, or the ferry back. The only time I've ever been to Greenway, I went for a wedding. Oh, and uh, we got a ferry there. It was lovely, and walked up from the. Oh place. yes, it's, it's the most beautiful spot. It was really nice. It was a really special event. Yes. Oh yes, I can imagine. Yeah, it's a wonderful place. So Samantha says, "Have you submitted a story for our charity anthology?" What's a Good question, Samantha. Oh, I didn't know there was one. <laughs> <laughs> we are making our own charity anthology and inviting our authors to submit a story. 
Oh, right. Going to support a special school in Cheshire, I think it is, or that way. I can't remember exactly where it is, but it's one of our members. Oh, right. It, so, when's it got to be done by? Um, September-ish. Oh, <laughs> that might be a bit tight. <laughs> I'm going away to Cheshire. <laughs> uh, she also says, do you have a favourite book that you've written? Oh, that's hard. That's like, I think it's about 25. Or 25. That's like asking um, which was your favourite child, really. <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure. Do you have a favourite main protagonist then? Who's your favourite out of Wesley? Abraham and Joe. Oh. Or is that like trying to choose between children? It is. That's like trying to choose between <laughs> children too. That's a, that's a favourite book. I'm, I'm quite proud of High Mortality, the, the Albert Lincoln and Boy Live with the Dead, um, the Albert Lincoln trilogy. That's... Uh, that meant quite a lot to me because uh, I got I got into it. I, I wrote it. I'd, I'd written a short story um, set just after the First World War for a CWA anthology, and uh, then I my my dad died. I was clearing out his house. And I found uh, some letters that had been sent to my mother's grandmother, and they were from a. Uh, a matron of a, a military field hospital in France uh, saying that her son was um, seriously injured and not expected to live. And there were two of these letters, you know, that he was getting worse. Uh, so that was that turned out to be my grandfather. But but he did survive. You know, the, the story had a happy ending. But it just got me thinking about, um, you know, the aftermath of the First World War and the, the effect on the on the women left behind and you know so, so that did mean quite a lot to me um writing those books well we're on that series because it's fantastic i mean high mortality of dogs is it's an amazing story really creepy as well i could not I started reading it at night and had to stop and find something else to read for a little while <laughs> Because the opening is so scary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, I can't read this now. <laughs> um, what are the different challenges to writing Abraham? Because I know you always have like a core of history in your books, and that's a really yeah. strong feature. But writing just completely set in the past, is that a, like a different challenge? Um. I must say I enjoy writing set in the past. I actually started out writing historical. I, I wrote um, a book called The Devil's Priest, uh, which is set in Tudor, Liverpool, um, where I'm from. And uh, it never got published. Uh, I got quite a lot of nice letters from publishers I'd sent it to, but saying it was the time of Brother Cadvile was out saying, oh, we're absolutely inundated with historical um, stories, the story we can't take, you know, we like it, but we can't take it. So it never got published. I published, in the end, I published it myself on Kindle. But uh, I, I do really love the historical aspect. That's why I started on the Wesley series. I thought, what if I have a modern day story, but with a historical background? So I don't think anyone else was doing it at the time. So I, I uh, wrote The Merchant's House. I, I, I came across a story which is as relevant oh, at any time of history than it is today. And I thought, oh, you know, I could do a modern bit and then a flashback to the past and sort of intertwine them. So that's how the Wesley series got to started, really. Do you, so the Wesley series is, as you said, quite long now you've got quite a lot of books in it do you have to keep because the characters in them are so detailed do you have to keep really detailed notes to know what's happened to them all the way through i don't really no i, I think i more or less remember 
hope I don't get anything wrong. I'm just like, we're all so real people, aren't they? There's like a lot, there's a kind of key cast of characters in there that are in every book. Yes. You must be, you know, to remember every detail about them. Oh, little things that have happened must be quite, quite a challenge over a number. Yeah, I bet it's because I've written so many. Uh, I'm there isn't a big gap. Like if I if I went back to write a Joe now, I'd probably have to read um, them, you know, because it's been a big gap. But with the Wesleys, I'll do it, you know, one a year, so say. So uh, it's not quite so bad. Do you have an end in sight for the Wesley series or any of the series? Well, obviously, the, the trilogy, you know, the third and final one is written and out in November. Uh, Wesley, do you know, I haven't, even, I haven't really thought about it. I'll probably go on as long as the publisher wants them and uh, and I keep getting ideas. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, do you have, so... I'm trying to think of how to word this because I love the Wesley series. Do you always try to find a historical story that links to the modern times? Is that quite a challenge to find really. that has an, an analogy to the modern times? Not really, because I find I find it all, you know there, there's always an analogy to the modern times. I, I'll give you an example. I was walking down the road in Dartmouth. And I saw this um, plaque on the wall, you know, on these blue plaques. And it said, here lived the calculating boy. And I thought, oh, on earth is a calculating boy? So I looked it up and it was this boy called George Parker Bidder. And I, I looked up his biography. And when he was little, he could do any sum in his head. And his father used to ex really exploit him. He used to hawk him round fairs and uh, inns making him perform, you know, give him a sum, <laughs> that sort of thing. And uh, then, you know, I, I thought, started thinking about the modern equivalent, um, these pushy parents with these child stars. So I had um, a child singing star who went missing. You know, it's, you know and uh, the story of the boy in the inn in the background. That, yeah, it's, but that's, it's a really inventive way of thinking that I know it's really interesting to hear that process. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, lots of other oh, examples. Yeah, you know, like in the funeral boat, I, I was uh, reading a, an article about um, raids on farms, you know, um, mass raiders uh, stealing quad bikes and tying the farmer up and, and, the, and the family. And then I, I, it was in the charity shop and I was reading uh, the Anglo Saxon. Uh, came across a copy of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And uh, I think in the year 997, the, the Danes came around uh, Devon killing and burning each thing they they met. So Viking raiders or modern day raiders, you know, if you're on the receiving end, it's probably not much difference. Uh, Samantha also said, with so much research for your books, do you plan them out in detail in advance or do you kind of See where Wesley and Co take you. I try and plan to a certain extent. I usually make a flow chart. You know, I, I have the sort of the solution in the middle and all the things leading up to it, and then the historical narrative at the side. Um, I often stray from that, though, as I get better ideas. I, I, I'm not one of these people who can make a detailed synopsis because I get, keep getting better ideas as I go along. But I, I like to know more or less where I'm going, so when I set off. Do you, any of your characters ever surprise you, though, when you're writing? Have any of them ever stood up and said, no, I'm not doing that, as you're writing something and gone in a completely unexpected way? <laughs> Um, I can't say they have really. No. I must have very obedient characters. Are there any scenes that you found that have been difficult to write? Uh, I can't. I can't really say. Only when you sort of 
get stuck on a plot point. <laughs> You know, and it's not sort of hanging together and you've got to sort of go and unravel it. How did it feel when sort of Pam was having her health issues and things? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I suppose that was quite, quite difficult, yeah. How much of a say do you have in your titles? And covers sometimes the well the the covers they usually send them to me and give me a, a choice of about two or three but they're, they're all so good uh, I've never had any complaints the titles they have wanted to change a few of my titles like um, the burial circle that started off as the burial club and uh, Dead Man's Lane starts off as Dead Man's Cross, but just, just little things like that. So they don't change? I, I always think that, you know, their marketing team probably know better than I do. So. How has the lockdown affected that, like marketing and things that you had? Because you did have a book come out, didn't you, just recently, or one delayed, I think it was. Uh, it's it's the burial circle uh, paperbacks being delayed till October. It's usually out first of all, you know, beginning of August, but um, it, that was uh, that was put off. Uh, lockdown has been hell for for most writers. I think I don't know what it is. It's been very very difficult to concentrate. I, I was having this conversation with Andrew Taylor. Um, on the panel we, we were on, and he described it as a, a sort of low level anxiety which stops you concentrating. And I think that is, you know, you, you'd think you'd have plenty of time to write, but it, it hasn't worked out that way. You just sort of constantly jumpy and can't, can't really get down to concentrating on what you should be doing. And also you like to get out and meet people and you like to get out, out of your, office and go and meet readers. I love going to libraries and festivals. And, you know, they've all been cancelled. I think you need that bit of a break, that bit of uplift. And, and uh, you know, you, you can go to a, a festival or something and come back really buzzing with ideas. And it, it's just, you need that uh, break and that contact with people. Yeah. A lot of ours, we've asked that question to quite a lot of the authors that we've interviewed and we we sort of found that a lot. Yeah. One yeah of them, a lot of... Oh, sorry, sorry. Go on. Okay. <laughs> One of our members, Mike, um, we had a, a sort of a running thread in our group the other day of like people's five favourite crime authors and you came quite... High in the honourable mentions of people's Ooh, top five. That's great. We tabulated everybody's votes and did a sort of top ten and things. And apparently he scored. He said that I had to mention it to you because I'm impressed that he made a spreadsheet of it, to be honest. <laughs> a list of comments. <laughs> a nice oh, thing. <laughs> Um, there's a question for me on the stream that says, where's my mug from? I bought up on purpose today. Uh, I've got the camera very wrong. Oh. I, um, one from my niece's deli over in Kingsway. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I thought it was thematic. It's the only thing I've got from Dartmouth. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> whenever we go... Um, down we live uh, probably slightly just up north from where you are um whenever we go down we tend to be very lazy and fly <laughs> really oh that's a good idea <laughs> um, yes yeah, it's about a five hour drive and <laughs> well neither of me or my husband drive and he's very tall and doesn't like doing any long journeys so we tend to fly down yeah that's a great idea yeah. Oh, don't tell my husband that to be buying the tickets. <laughs> Do you know last time it worked out cheaper than the train? 
I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And then we just go to Exeter. Mm. Yes. A lot of fun. Yeah. Then how do you get from Exeter to the south? Um, normally get collected by <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <by> someone. <laughs> um so are there any characters that you're gonna no, the next question I'm gonna ask you actually is there's a lovely little hint of the supernatural in a lot of your books. So there, it's really strong in the Joe. Yeah. Isn't it? But it does come up in like Wesley and some of the others as well. Mm -hmm. Is that a thing that you're drawn to or you've got an interest in the supernatural? Um, I think I'm always attracted to the sort of gothic. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, the old superstitions of uh, historical superstitions and that sort of thing. I loved uh, researching Dead Man's Lane with um, the belief in the revenants, you know, the undead. I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> and I, I like to put a bit of creepiness in, like the mechanical devil had the. Um, the little robot. Oh God, that one's uh, really creepy. Yeah, the creepy little robot, <laughs> which is based on a real one. <laughs> Was it based on a real one? Yes, yes, it's in the Smithsonian Museum in America. Uh, it's um, it was made for Philip II of Spain. It was, uh, you know. You know, a couple of feet tall and it's um, in the form of a little monk and it was supposed to say prayers for Philip's son who was ill and, and he had this little automaton made to stay, say prayers it's a sinister looking thing so I thought oh I'm using that <laughs> you see things in the paper it gives you a terrific excuse to read the paper every day and uh, you, you see things like that and they you know really catch your imagination and go, I've got to bring that into a book <laughs> Do you spend a lot of time reading like the local myths and legends of the areas that you write in? Yeah, yes, yeah. I've got, uh, well, my bookshelves behind me, I've got a whole section on Devon and South Devon and the myths and legends, famous murders, etc., etc. So. I'd imagine with the, like, especially the Joe series, that must be so easy to get the supernatural in because York is like one of the most haunted. Oh yes, it's terrific. Yeah, <laughs> on Earth, isn't it? It's like well, I got I got the idea for the series from going on one of these ghost walks with my, with my son. He was, I think we were on a, a dig there, um, me and my son, and uh, we we thought, oh, what should we do in the evening? And we went on one of these ghost walks, and I was my eyes were really popping out. Like, oh, that's a great idea! That's a great idea! So uh, that's how the uh, series was born. <laughs> Yeah, they're very proud of their um, ghost. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I've got some lo lovely books on York's ghosts as well. Would you ever be tempted to send, uh, have like a crossover between any of them? You know, they're going to meet Wesley and helping out on a... I have thought of that. I don't know how my publisher would react, but <laughs> <laughs> in my dreams, yes, it would be nice. Actually, um, I think Wesley has gone up. I've forgotten which book it was. But Wes, Wesley go has gone up. Huh? He did go up north, didn't he? Oh, it, yeah, they've been up north a few times. Uh, oh, which which book was it? Oh, was it the... Oh, you know, I forgot, I've forgotten. <laughs> but uh, what one, he does go to the outskirts of York. You said you... Oh, I know, I think it was The Mermaid's Scream. Yeah, mermaid scream. <laughs> you said you're from Liverpool. Is that why you made Jerry be from there? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've known a lot of Jerry's in my time. <laughs> I've got to be honest, he's probably one of my favourites. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's lovely. He's lovely, Jerry. Half a gold. <laughs> There's a question on the stream that says, do you read any other crime authors? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, oh, I'm, I'm always got a crime novel on the go. Um, I'm about to embark on one of Peter Lovesies. He's one of my favourite uh, 
authors um, like Phil Rickman, uh, Christopher Fowler, uh, Mark Martin, Fred Martin Edwards, Andrew Taylor, all oh, so many of Peter Robinson. Um, Reginald Hill was one of my favourites, you know, D.L. and Pasco. Um, I, I just uh, read or um, well, reread uh, Barbara Vine's Fatal Inversion, a brilliant book. My well, favourite favorite class, you know, um, author of the Golden Age, probably Josephine Tay, Rich, um, Daughter of Time and Franchise Affair, absolutely brilliant books. Would you ever be tempted to write something in that kind of genre, like a Golden Age or a really gothic kind of fiction? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would. <laughs> yes, that's probably for the future. I'll have to uh, see what the publisher says. <laughs> uh, Samantha asks, uh, this is one of our favourite author chat questions, actually. What are your most memorable moments as an author? Oh, right. Oh, oh I think when I was, um, you know, invested into the detection club i was invited to join the detection club and i had to uh, attend a dinner at the ritz and i had to uh, swear an oath on a skull <laughs> eric called eric <laughs> that's brilliant. very very ancient ceremony <laughs> but that's probably one of my, one of the highlights also presenting a murder mystery at uh, the Athenaeum Club in Liverpool, which was uh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. You do um, I've spoken in uh, quite a lot of places, and yeah, I, I often think, you know, I wouldn't have been if I wasn't an author. I wouldn't, wouldn't have been <laughs> to these places. It has uh, widened my horizons quite a lot. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> We've also got a question here that says, where did the idea from Wes for, for Wesley originally come from? I don't, I don't really. It's difficult to say. It's sort of formed gradually. I've um, got a friend from Trinidad, and she comes from a very medical family. And so I suppose I, I got the idea from that. You know, what if I had this... Um, this uh, detective who's, who who has an archaeology degree, you know, because he had to have an interest in history and archaeology. Uh, but he came from a medical family who disapproved a little of uh, him following archaeology instead of medicine. And uh, of course, he had uh, Neil as his uh, best uni friend. You know, so that uh, introduced the historical aspect. And then uh, he met Jet, met up with Jerry. <laughs> so. It sort of seemed like the dream team, really. There's, um, he's not always the most perfect character either, is he? I quite like how you make him quite human, Wesley. Yeah, I, I think I think if you had a, a very goody goody detective, it would be a bit cloying. Yeah, you know, he's just human, really. He's a good, he's a good man. You know, he's. Uh, He's one of the good guys, but uh, you know, he has his, everybody has their failings, don't they? <laughs> you wouldn't be human if you didn't. Because they kind of develop their theories. So like they're getting older, um, and the kids are growing up. Would you ever write about lockdown? I don't know, um, probably not, because it's been so unpleasant. But the book, funnily enough, the book I'm, I've uh, just sent off, the next Wesley one, The Butterfly Cage, is about people being confined. It's about this anchoress being uh, confined in this cell. And uh, in modern day, uh, this woman in the 1950s being confined in an asylum. Now, how I did, I, I must be psychic because I, I, started it i had the idea long before lockdown was ever you know a glint in boris johnson's eye I mean, it was, uh, so when i was writing it you know all about people being imprisoned and being confined i sort of think 
you know, I, I was thinking, this is weird. This is weird. <laughs> and yet I had the idea ages ago. Yeah, I must admit, when I was reading A High Mortality of Doves, it talks about the Spanish flu. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, or well, that would happen. Without, I'm not trying not to give away spoilers, but there are, it's obvious that there will be some discussion because it's set after World War One. Oh, that was far worse than anything today. <laughs> that was horrendous. And lo all the you know, loads of young men who came back from the war unscathed just died, died of the Spanish flu. It was really awful. <laughs> so one of the stories I read, and I'm trying to think of how to explain I don't think it gives away a spoiler too much, but there's you talk about in the soldiers who were being wounded in the war, if they were wounded in their faces, them having oh the portrait mask, a portrait mask. That was yes. really creepy. Do you want to tell our um our viewers <laughs> about it? Well, when people had terrible facial injuries in the war. Um, uh, some pioneering um, surgeons and, art and artists made these masks that were made of copper, painted, um, to um, replicate their features. So they put these masks on and at, at a distance they would look perfectly unscathed, I suppose when, once you got up close. But the, you know, the very skillful artists made them and uh, you know, covered up some pretty horrendous injuries. So, it was, you know, it was, it was a great thing for the poor, poor uh, wounded soldiers. Do you ever find yourself writing something like that and sort of scare yourself a little bit? Hmm. Not really, because I, I suppose I'm in control. So I know, I know how far I can take it. I perhaps scare myself a bit when I get the initial idea, but once I've worked, once I'm working on it, probably not in that uh, frame of mind. Um, with Abraham as well, I suppose as a as a policeman when he was around, there must be very different challenges in how you sort of solve the crimes for him because he doesn't have any real forensic. No, no, does he in any way? No, no, of course. You know, we've got to rely on sort of. Well, I think you know there must have been quite a lot of miscarriages of justice in those days, and of course, considering there was hanging, you know, they could uh, have uh, some horrendous consequences. But yes, uh, in some ways, it's quite nice to write about that because you haven't got to always bear in mind. Oh, but their mobile phone can be tracked. Oh, but their. Uh, no, the DNA will be on that. No, so, so it's it's quite nice to go back to basics in a way. Do you have to learn quite a lot about forensics to write sort of a modern police procedure? Oh yes, you've got to keep up to date. Yeah, I've got quite a lot of books on it, and also in the conferences I, I, I mentioned earlier, we have forensic scientists um, to uh, talk to us as well, and that actually. I've got a, a good neighbour who's um, who's in uh, that uh, field, so I can, <laughs> I can ask him. I asked him so, a question recently. <laughs> That's because <DNA. laughs> um, it's a thing I studied actually is um, DNA, and it's one of the things that always really bugs me if I read a book and they make a mistake, like science and things that. It can yes. pull out as a reader, even though you don't expect people to be perfect, it's got to be believable. Yes, yeah. You know, I suppose that's why we're going back to what you were saying about changing names slightly, it gives you a little bit more license. Oh, it certainly does, yeah. <laughs> um, are there like real places in Dartmouth, like Bayard's Cove or the Castle and things like that? that you keep and want to write about in the books? Oh, I've written about, uh, yeah, I think the uh, last scene of the burial circle takes uh, place in the castle. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry in, in the Bayard's Fort, not in the castle. But I have, have used the castle as well, and the road to the castle, I think, in the Jackal Man. Um, there was a murder on the road to the castle. So. 
<laughs> do you um aren't there like smugglers things around there as well were there, were there smugglers around there? Could you have used smugglers? Oh, lot, lots of smuggling went on in the West Country. I haven't actually done smugglers yet, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> the future was the I've used time. wreckers. I've used wreckers um, in the skeleton room. I, I, the wreckers who used to lure the ships ashore and uh, then uh, murder into and loot and everything. I've, I've used those in the skeleton room, which was uh, great fun. <laughs> you come across all sorts of weird and wonderful things when you're researching. Uh, uh, when I was researching the wreckers, I came across a family called the, the Greggs of Clavelli, who were supposed to have killed, pickled and ate more than a thousand victims. <laughs> when they were joining their wrecking exploits. So you, do, wow. you do come across some uh, weird and wonderful uh, <laughs> Do you, story. that is a really, how could you eat a thousand? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not, it, it might not be strictly true, but <laughs> that's the local legend. <laughs> but I think all local legends can be a little bit embellished. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which is, is yeah, they don't let anything get, get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so, having been quite so prolific in your career with like so many books, do you have any like little writing rituals or you know, sort of things you do to celebrate the end or publication of each book? Whenever I've finished the last draft and uh get it sent off to my publisher. I always tidy my office. <laughs> get everything out of the way. And <laughs> that, that's a couple of alcoholic drinks as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, li I like to get everything straight then. And, uh, Because um, my gets in a terrible, terrible mess when I'm actually writing because I've just got papers everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, if you've got all those threads to weave together, I'd imagine you would have quite a lot of stuff mm. around. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lo lovely feeling to get everything out of the way. <laughs> Samantha also wonders what other interesting or surprising legends you've come across, like the pickling the bodies. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Oh, there's all sorts. Oh, it's that was uh, picking out. Um, oh, there was a, a Joe Plantagenet one that uh, um, I based the um, was that playing with bones on, and that was about um, this place in Bedern near the Minster. It was a, a little close of houses, and there was a, a ragged school there. And the master of the ragged school used to be paid for each pupil. And but uh, he used to uh, abuse, you know, send send the uh, kids up chimneys and everything. But when they died, he, d he didn't let anybody know. He, j he just buried them in the walls, so he'd still get paid for them for their upkeep. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty horrendous story. <laughs> so I so I and, and the. Bed and supposed to be haunted by the ghosts of these children. Well, it probably is everywhere in York is. Yes. Haunted yeah. by something as a an entire missing Roman legion near there. Oh yes, yeah, the cellar of the treasures of treasure, treasurer's house. You can't move for ghosts. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, oh, dear me. Um do you have so because Jerry's getting quite old, is Jerry gonna? Or what, is he gonna retire from the police? Um, he oh, has um, toyed with the idea of retiring, and then he decided uh, not to because he thought, "What would I do with myself?" <laughs> it's just gonna be one of those that he's always gonna be at his desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, nowadays people retire from the police and then they go back as a civilian investigator. So I suppose I could have him doing that. Yeah, going back to help out or just be a nuisance. Yeah, must be a nuisance probably. <laughs> <laughs> I would give Wesley a bit of well-deserved promotion. 
would you sort of see any of those characters move out or away? Or are you going to just keep them as like a tight knit sort of grouping throughout the series? I quite like uh, writing about them, so I haven't got any plans to have any of them move away. Of course, um, yeah, uh, Rachel is uh, pregnant now. I don't know. Hmm. Or did you not know? <laughs> no, evidently I haven't got that far. <laughs> oh, <laughs> at the end of the burial circle. <laughs> Well, we've not got the burial so yeah, so there might be a, might be a few um a few changes there i suppose <laughs> is there because there's always a little kind of a bit of a will they won't they with wesley does that ever yeah. get resolved um not as yet no as i say she's she's married now and uh, she might she married nigel the farmer and uh yeah, <laughs> I won't say any more. <laughs> I really like Rachel as a character, and it. Oh no, she's great. She's quite a feisty person who sort of wants to go off and be her own thing, isn't she? And um, you know, being like in the police and stuff rather than being a farmer or. Mm. Yes, yes, I like Rachel. Yeah, yeah, she's great. If you, by the way, if you're watching this and haven't read any of these books, you must go and buy some. They're great. Um, Samantha says, are there any other series you'd like to write in any other genres? Oh, I don't think I'd ever move away from crime of some kind. I quite like the idea of a sort of golden age, or that's something set in the 60s, or even, you know, a standalone, you know, to, just to sort of do something different. Um, but nothing, I've been quite, kept pretty busy with what, what I've been doing, so I've not really had a chance to think about it, but uh, certainly, you know, in the future, never rule, rule anything out, but it would be crime of some kind. My um, favourite author chat question to ask people is, would you ever produce a graphic novel of one of your books? Oh, I don't think so. Has it, I presume you have to be good at art to presume to. You can hire an artist. Oh, because uh, I'm useless at art. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely useless. <laughs> so I've got a question on here that says, what inspired you to become an author? Just something I've always wanted to do from when I was little, really. Uh, yeah, it just, I've always written bits and pieces. And uh, in fact, I, I, at an author event um, in the on the Wirral, I met up with a couple of old, my old school friends and my husband, and we had dinner together. And my husband asked them, did you, did you know she was going to become an author? And they said, oh, yes. Because <laughs> I was always writing bits and pieces and <laughs> what are you working on at the moment ah i've just finished um uh, the butterfly cage wesley's uh, next adventure and i'm waiting for um my editor's comments <laughs> so yeah, having a much deserved rest Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm, go I'm going to Devon in a couple of weeks. So uh, after that, I will start on the next project. Uh, one of our members, I think it's Mike, has said how nice it must be to be able to create character and then go on to like them as we readers do. Oh, go on to. So. Go on to like them as we readers do. So you know how yeah. you really like Rachel and some of the other characters. Yes, it, it's more difficult uh, writing about somebody you don't like. I mean, I know you know a good villain is always uh, it's always fun to write about, but I couldn't write about somebody I didn't like book after book. I, I think there was one um, nasty character um, in the first Wesley books called Steve Caster, as he was a. Um, is a detective constable, horrible racist, nasty, you know, just snide. 
I didn't like him at all. Anyway, I killed him off. <laughs> so. so we've got five minutes left. All right. <laughs> Would you just like to sort of remind everyone of your main, your three series is, and characters and books? So right, can... well, it's uh, 24 books in the Wesley Peterson series. Um, it's Wesley Peterson, DI, uh, his boss, Jerry Heffernan, DCI, and uh, his sergeant, uh, Rachel Tracy. And they, they uh, solve terrible crimes in the mean lanes of South Devon. And there's always a historical crime going on in the background through Wesley's old university pal, uh, Neil Watson. Uh, then there's a Joe Plantagenet uh, series. They're set uh, in the thinly disguised York. And as we've been discussing, there are lots of spooky goings on in those. And then there's the uh, trilogy, the Albert Lincoln trilogy. Um, Albert's a Scotland Yard detective and uh, he travels up north to uh, solve some very puzzling cases. So uh, but the first one is High Mortality of Doves. The second is Boy Who Lived With The Dead. And the third out in November is called The House of the Hanged Woman. Wow. So, sounds good. Yeah, so that's my three <laughs> series. Someone has asked, oh, that's really good. They said, has anything happened in Sidmouth? In? Sidmouth. Sidmouth? No, I think I've stuck to the South Hams. <laughs> Great. Well, it's been a genuine pleasure to have you. Oh, on. it's been lovely to see you. <laughs> if only online. <laughs> <laughs> online. But it's been, I mean, I don't know about everyone else in here. I'm speaking for myself here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and find out more about the series. Is, um, And I think some of your stories that you've told us about your research and the things that the, the stories that you've based like Wesley on and things like that have been fascinating. So thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Caroline. It's been a pleasure.